In speaking about prayer, uh, Dr. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones once said that everything we do in the Christian life is easier than prayer. Prayer is undoubtedly the ultimate test because a man can speak to others with greater ease than he can speak to God. Have we not all known what it is to find that somehow we have less to say to God when we are alone than when we are in the presence of others? I remember a few years ago, uh, Dorcas and I were team leaders during teen week, and we were sharing a challenge with the teenagers in our group to take 15 minutes a day to pray, 15 minutes. And it was really interesting during the week to hear the, the feedback that we got, not just from the teens, but from the, the other leaders in our group as well, is how difficult they found that to be. One of them was sharing with me and saying that, you know, I, I sat down and I started to pray. And, and I thought, man, I have really spent a long time here praying. And I looked at my watch and seven minutes had gone by. <laughs> and from the extensive time that we see devoted into, in the Gospels to not only how Jesus himself prayed and how much time he spent praying, but how he took time to teach us to pray. We can see that this is something that we do need help with. We do need instruction on. And so we've been going for the last several weeks through Matthew chapter 6 as this passage of Scripture we've been looking at, which is known to us as the Lord's Prayer. And the very fact that Jesus devoted so much time to this is just a very clear indication that we do need help in learning to have our conversations with Almighty God. Last week we saw that as he taught us, uh, give us this day our daily bread as we are to bring that request to our Father in heaven. He was showing us that, first of all, we have a Father in heaven who cares and understands that we have physical, material needs that need to be met. And he also wants us to understand the reality of the fact that we are completely dependent upon him for everything that we have. No matter how much you have in your refrigerator or your freezer, every single bit of it has been given to you by God. And it could be gone in a moment. And we also learn that by going to him every day, he wants us to focus on the daily needs for that day, what God has given us for that day, so that we can do what God has given us to do for that day without worrying or preoccupying ourselves too much about tomorrow. We also saw that we are to do this every day is that trust needs to be renewed every day as we come to our Heavenly Father. And after teaching us to pray, though, about our physical needs, Jesus now turns to our spiritual needs. And as he does that, he teaches us to pray and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And this is what we're going to be looking at and considering today. And I find it very interesting that out of all of the spiritual needs that Jesus could have addressed in teaching us to pray, that this is the one that he honed in on. And not only that, but this is the one about which he he takes some time after teaching us to pray to expound upon and to explain and to flesh out because he goes on after he finishes this part here about the Lord's Prayer. He says, but if you forgive others your trespass, their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And from this, I cannot come to any other conclusion other than the fact that we are all in constant need of forgiveness. And so just as we ask God for our daily bread, we are to go to God daily and seek his forgiveness for the sins we commit. But not only that, we are also in constant need of forgiving one another. And just as we are to ask him for our daily bread, so we are to make sure that when we come to him, that we have forgiven those people who have sinned against us as we are seeking his forgiveness for our own sins. Now, as we look at this, the first thing that we need to remember here in in this petition to God, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, is to remember the people to whom Jesus was talking. 
Uh, the people that Jesus was speaking to were the ones he's already instructed who can call God their father. Because that was the first thing we talked about. He said, when you go to him, say, our father in heaven. And as we've mentioned several times and gone over, we don't come into the world born into that relationship. On the contrary, it's the opposite. We come into this world running away from God, not seeking after God, rebelling against God, seeking our own way and our own will. But here Jesus is speaking to people who has had that taken care of. And as we saw, and as was just mentioned in the scripture here that that Brittany read. uh, Brandon, can you advance the next slide? Somehow I'm not getting a signal here. (laughs) We're stuck. Oh, well, we'll just go on. But that verse that Brittany just read to us, which she said was just such a beautiful thing, and it's really awesome because I, I, it just brought tears to my eyes because here it is that we're going to say it again. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, and that's where we were, we were far off, alienated, separated from God. You who were once far off have now been brought near by the blood of Christ, for through him we both have access to the Father. See, that's how we have access to the Father. That's how we can call him Father is through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, because he came and he died and he shed his blood for us on the cross and he rose again from the dead. And when we believe that, as he said, he's delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. And as we're talking about forgiveness, forgiveness is the heart and the soul of the message that Jesus preached and the message that he sent his disciples out to preach after he rose from the dead and and went to heaven. In Luke's gospel in chapter 24, it says, Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. And as one who had heard that call and had received that forgiveness, the Apostle Paul was explaining about how he had taken this commission and how Jesus had sent him out as well. And he says, And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead, To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Excuse me, that was Peter, not Paul. Everyone who believes in the gospel of Jesus is the gospel of forgiveness. It's the good news that we can be forgiven because Jesus has paid for our offenses against God with his own body and with his own blood. And it's not that God just casts some blanket of forgiveness over the whole world, which is something that is a a teaching called universalism, that God just is going to save everybody, which the Bible does not teach. What this teaches is, is that everyone who comes to him by faith, everyone who acknowledges their sin against God, and with a humble, repentant heart and simple childlike faith, believes that what Jesus did was for me. I want that for myself, Father. Please forgive me. And when that person does so, God forgives their sins. That's what this is all about, is being forgiven. But listen to me very carefully. God does not force forgiveness upon anyone who sees no need to be forgiven. Let me say that again. God does not force forgiveness on anyone who sees no need to be forgiven. Sometime, I believe it was back at Christmas time, I was sharing a message about God's gift of forgiveness, how that, you know, on Christmas morning we we open up presents and there are some presents that you really like and some that are, eh, well, that's okay. But the thing about the gift of forgiveness is that that's only a gift that you're able to receive. That's only a gift that you're able to appreciate when you know that you need it. And if you don't believe me, just try offering forgiveness to somebody who doesn't believe that they need to be forgiven. You ever have an argument with your wife or your husband? 
I know none of you ever argue with your wife or your husband. But you ever have an argument with your spouse or with one of your children or with somebody at work and there's some kind of disagreement, some problem that comes up and you're butting heads and you're, you're talking this thing out and you start to lay the issues out and say, well, it's this and it's this and you did that and you did that and, and, and well, this is how I felt when you did this and you, and you go through it all and, and it's sort of starting to wind down and then somebody says, one of the parties says, well, that's okay, I forgive you. What kind of reaction does that bring sometimes? You forgive me. I should be the one forgiving you because you started the whole thing. This is more your fault than it is mine. And you see what I'm saying. But here's the, here's the deal, folks. You will never come to God for his forgiveness if you do not understand that you need to be forgiven. You see, we're all really fond of the idea that, that we have a God up there who just forgives everything. We like that idea. Kind of that, that way we can just kind of live the way that we want and don't have to worry about any consequences. That's the concept that, that so many people in the world have of forgiveness. But forgiveness can only be received when you understand, and this is what we don't like, when we, when we, we have to admit that we have done things actually that need to be forgiven. We need forgiving and as much as much as we, we we don't like that that's what we have to do and you know instead of coming to God and saying I've sinned I was wrong no excuses for it this is on me absolutely no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I was wrong. You, you know what we do? We come and we say things like, well, sometimes I make mistakes. Or I experienced a moral failure. Or I didn't really mean to, I wasn't really lying. I just exaggerated a little bit. Or I was afraid of what would happen if I really, if I really spoke the truth. Yeah, I took the company's tools home. They got millions. They can afford it. And, you know, we just have all kinds of ways to excuse and justify the things that we do, to justify our sin. And, and, and people will never seek God's forgiveness unless they know they need to be forgiven. We'll never do that. But when you hear and understand from the Word of God that God does not measure you according to how well you stack up to your next door neighbor or the person sitting next to you in the pew. God measures you against himself, his own righteousness. You see, that's what we fall short of. And when you read the law of God, which is like a mirror, and it shows us who we are and shows us what we are, and you read things like, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, and you think about all the times that you've said, forgive me for the illustration, oh God, oh my God. And you think about all the times that you've said that and God's name has crossed your lips without you thinking about who it is that you're talking about. When you realize that you've stolen things, when you realize that you have wanted things that belong to somebody else, when you realize that you have told lies, and not only that, but you realize and you understand that everything you've done, every word you've ever said, every fantasy that you've ever indulged in with your mind is all naked and open, laid bare before the God with whom we must all give an account. And folks, when that sinks in, when we understand it and when we see that, that's when we're ready to hear about forgiveness because that's when we know that we need it. And that is when the gospel becomes good news because it's good news that everything that is recorded on your DVD can be reformatted and erased and nobody is ever going to see it. And that, and that God will completely wipe out that debt 
Because his son, Jesus, stepped onto death row in your place and took your punishment. Went to the cross for you. Died in your place and rose again from the dead at infinite cost to himself and to his father. And it is through him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And once we come to him by faith in Jesus our Savior, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. It's an old bluegrass song that my mom used to listen to when I was a kid. It says, the cold bars around you are stronger than steel. You cannot see them. You know they are real. Your jailer is Satan. Your crimes are your sins. Do you want a pardon from the prison you're in? You cannot escape it. The walls are too high. You'll stay there inside it. And there you will die. But someone paid your bondage. If you'll let him in, he'll give you a pardon from the prison of sin. And God offers you that pardon through his son Jesus, who came into that prison with you, took your spot on death row, went and took the punishment that you had coming, and then rose from the dead. And now he offers you his hand to take you off of death row. And not just off of death row, but to walk you out of that prison. And into the family of God. Adopted as one of his own children. Dearly beloved. Whom he will love forever. Never ever to return to that prison house of sin. That's what he's offering you. And that's what he's given us. And now we can call him Father. And so after that happens, do we all live happily ever after? And just never sin against each other ever again? Is that what happens? Most of you are smiling. Because most of you have been there and you know what I'm talking about and know that that just simply is not the case. In fact, uh, the Apostle Paul found out himself that this was not the case. As he, because as he left the prison house of sin, he realized he had brought somebody with him. Because at one point he said, I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. So it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Within me, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Any of you ever been there? <laughs> See, even though Jesus has taken us out of the prison house of sin and we have received that judicial forgiveness, I mean, this is just an awesome thought, that the judge himself comes down and takes our place on death row. Even though we have received that judicial forgiveness, never again to return to the prison house of sin, we find that even now as we are part of the family of God adopted as his children, we still have this thing clinging to us that the Bible calls the flesh. That old part of us that still has that urge, that, that pull to the old things and, and, and the old way of thinking and the old way of living. And sometimes we give in to it. And that's when we sin. And it is for those sins that Jesus is saying, we need to pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, we don't need to be saved again. That's already been taken care of once and for all. But what we do need is this daily cleansing from the sins that we commit as believers, as members of God's family. And this is what Jesus was partially getting across to the disciples on the night that he was betrayed and handed over to be crucified. You remember there was a, they were there in the upper room and somebody had thoughtfully provided a basin of water and a towel for the unpleasant job of washing people's feet that the servants usually did. But who did it? Jesus. Jesus bent down and he took that towel and he began to wash the disciples' feet and as soon as he did that, Peter didn't like it. And Peter said, no, you're never going to wash my feet. 
And Jesus said to him, he says, if, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. See, Peter was, was kind of an all or nothing kind of a guy. It's like first he's saying, no, Jesus, you ain't washing my feet. To, hey, not just my feet, but wash my hands and my head and, and just wash all of me. And Jesus said, no, we don't need to do that, Peter. You've already been washed. You've already been cleansed. Just your stinky feet. And the thing is, is that as we walk through this world, I, I like the way John MacArthur put it, you know, dirt on, on feet symbolizes the daily contamination from sin that we experience as we walk through life. As D. Martin Lloyd-Jones put it, there is only one washing for the entire person. That's our justification. But having been justified as we walk through this world, we become soiled and tarnished by sin. And that is true of every Christian. And it is for those sins that we need to go for that daily cleansing. And 1 John tells us how to do that. He says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And once again, as we saw a few weeks ago in Luke chapter 17... That the forgiveness that Jesus taught is a forgiveness that is tied to repentance. And in the same way, we need, when we come to God with our sin, we need to confess it. And to confess it means to say the same thing about it that God says. It's not that you stretch the truth a little bit. You lied. And lying is a sin. It's not that, well, I was really grouchy because, you know, I had a bad day at work, and so when I came home, I was grouchy, and I blew off a little bit. No, 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 no. What you had was what Galatians 5 calls an outburst of anger, and an outburst of anger is a sin, and you need to confess it. When you take something that doesn't belong to you, it is a sin. When you indulge in fantasies about somebody that is not your husband or not your wife, it is a sin. You call it what it is. You say the same thing about it that God does. But you know when you do that, what happens? He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In that same passage, you read in 1 John, there's a beautiful picture there. It says, John says, I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And, and, and when we sin, you know, the Bible says that Satan is an accuser and that he accuses us before the throne of God night and day. And, and so when you sin, Satan would like nothing better than to take you back to the prison house of sin and set you on death row next to his seat. Because, see, that's where he's going. Read the book of Revelation if you want the end of the story. He ends up in the lake of fire in torment forever and ever. And he wants to take you with him. He wants to take everybody with him. But when Satan comes and he accuses you and says, hey, look at what he did. He sinned again. He comes face to face with your defense attorney, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, uh-uh. You can't have him. Because I paid for that sin that he did. You see these scars in my hands? I paid for that. And not only that, but I paid for every sin he's ever committed. And every sin he ever will commit. So you're done here. You have no business with this person. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. We just come and confess it to him. But then there's the next part. Where he says, forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. This is how Jesus is teaching us to pray. And so what exactly does that mean? Well, first of all, Jesus is very clearly not teaching that we somehow earn God's forgiveness by forgiving others. That would fly in the face of everything we have just seen from the word of God of how God offers his forgiveness freely to repentant sinners through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
He does not tell us to pray, forgive us because we have forgiven our debtors or forgive us on the grounds that we have forgiven our debtors. He says, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And what Jesus is teaching us here is that as we come to him for that daily cleansing that we need for the sins that we commit, whether it's once a day, twice a day, or seven times a day or more, as we come to him, we need to make sure that we have also forgiven those people who have sinned against us. And a few weeks ago, as we finished with our series on relationships, in a message called What No Relationship Can Do Without, and if you didn't get a chance to look at that, you can look it up on YouTube and listen to it. We looked at Luke chapter 17, where Jesus talks extensively about forgiveness and what it involves and what it is, and our obligation to forgive one another, even if somebody sins against you seven times in the same day. And you remember what the disciples' reaction to that was? Lord, increase our faith. Man, that's asking a lot, Lord. That's some kind of a super faith you must be talking about, and we don't have it. But Jesus' answer to them was, if you had faith the size of a grain of a mustard seed, you'd be able to move a mountain. And he goes on to explain, and rather than reinforcing this idea they had that forgiveness is difficult for the child of God, he says, this is something you will be able to do, and you will do, if you have faith any faith at all, even just a tiny little bit. And when you have done so, you will say, we are only unprofitable servants. We have only done that which was our duty to do. Forgiving other people is not some kind of a super faith or super Christianity. This is Christianity 101, ABC 123. This is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Because we are forgiven, we are to be forgiving people. And this morning, I would like to take just a few moments to look at another similar parable that Jesus gave that's found in Matthew chapter 18. And there in verse 21, we read, Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? To hear Peter, he's still trying. You know. At first the Lord had talked about seven times, and now he says, okay, now, now I'm going to get this. <laughs> Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused, and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. And when his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and went and reported to their master all that had taken place. And then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant. I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also, my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Now, there have been various different explanations given for these really difficult words that Jesus utters here. Some of them are so stark it kind of hits you in the chest like, a, like the butt of a log. 
But sometimes I believe that when we, when we read a passage like this one, we are so quick to find a filter and filter it through a theological grid that somehow serves to lessen the impact of what Jesus is saying and make it not quite so intense. But while our, th- our understanding of theology is very important, and we should compare Scripture with Scripture all the time, we should be doing that. What I believe is far more important here is that we just let the words of Jesus hit us square in the face the way he clearly intended those words to do. As someone once put it, we need to always remember when we're reading God's word that the promises in the Bible are real promises and the warnings in the Bible are real warnings. And folks, we ignore those warnings at our peril. And whatever else is being said in this parable, what is absolutely and undeniably clear is that Jesus is giving a very solemn warning to every person who refuses to forgive his brother from the heart. And I believe it is in these words from the heart that we find the key to what Jesus is saying about such a person who is described here in this parable. Once again, Jesus is not teaching that we earn forgiveness by our forgiveness of others, nor is he saying that you can lose your salvation by by refusing to forgive others. But what he is saying is that receiving, both receiving God's forgiveness and passing on that forgiveness to someone else is a matter of the heart. Forgiveness is not merely the commutation of a sentence or the cancellation of a debt. In fact, the fact is, you can forgive somebody a money debt, and you can still be filled with anger and resentment in your heart toward that person. And in the same way, you can receive a suspended sentence Or have somebody pay your fine for you. And you have absolutely no gratitude, no thankfulness, no appreciation of the pity and the mercy that person had. Or the cost that they had to give to pay for your crime. And the problem with this person that Jesus calls a wicked servant, this wicked servant is that while his monetary or his material debt had been taken care of, his heart had remained completely unaffected and unchanged. He had no perception of his master's heart, of his pity, and of his mercy. And because his heart was unchanged, he had no mercy in his heart for someone when they sinned against him. And so this wicked man was shown up to be the person that he really was. Sometimes people are eager to receive God's forgiveness in the sense that they perceive it as just getting out of the consequences of their sin without giving any thought at all to the sin itself. And there's no repentance, there's no remorse, and there's no appreciation at all of what it cost Almighty God to give the life of his one and only son on that cross to pay for you. And to them, their perception of salvation is only that it's a fire escape from hell or that it's like an insurance policy that you take and you just sort of fold up and tuck away and put in the filing cabin and in the intellectual chambers of your mind and you think, well, I'll pull that out someday when I die. That's what that's for, taken care of. But then those people show their true colors when somebody sins against them. And when they find there is no mercy and forgiveness 
in their own heart. It is because their own sinful, wicked, stony heart has never been melted by the grace of God. And so this in-your-face warning of Jesus is to be understood. That forgiveness is a matter of the heart. And if you find no forgiveness in your heart for other people, then the simple truth is you have never really experienced God's forgiveness yourself. As Warren Wiersbe put it, Jesus was not teaching that believers earn God's forgiveness by forgiving others. However, if we have truly experienced God's forgiveness, then we will have a readiness to forgive others. Or as D. Martin Lloyd-Jones put it, the proof that you and I are forgiven is that we forgive others. And so we do need instruction on how to pray, don't we? <laughs> Very convicting as I was preparing this and the Lord would bring bringing to my mind people who in the past that I was still holding some resentment toward and it's like, oh God, Forgive me, God, I confess that to you right now. How can I possibly ever hold some resentment against somebody else because of what you've done for me? And as we come to our, in our daily prayers to our Father in heaven, we pray, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. As we're reminded of the forgiveness that God has given to us and that forgiveness that we must extend to others. And so in this manner, Jesus teaches us to pray. Father, as we come to you this morning, Father, I just thank you that we can call you Father. And Father, I, you know, Lord, that I don't know the hearts of every person in this room. I know that you do. And Father, first of all, I just want to pray if there is anybody here who has never received your forgiveness, never come to terms with the fact that they have sinned against you in such a way that it cost the life of your own son to save them. Lord, I pray that right now, this minute, as I'm talking to you, that they will call out to you in repentance and receive your forgiveness believing and claiming that wonderful truth Lord that your son died in their place and rose again from the dead and is ready to take them out of the prison house of sin and father I also pray Lord that if there's anyone here who is holding a grudge against someone someone who's refusing to forgive God, I pray that you would let the stark truth of the words that you have spoken speak to that person and that they will speedily in their heart forgive this person. And if there's a conversation that needs to take place later about it, that Lord, that they will do so without delay. And Father, once again, we just thank you for the wonderful gift of your word. And Lord, I pray that it will have the effect that you intended this morning. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to be here at the front for a few moments. If anybody has anything you'd like to talk about,